This is the community manager's best friend, you. A session from eMetrics Boston, October 2012, presented by Tim Wilson. So if you've grown up in the United States or maybe even were exposed to pop culture, American pop culture of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you probably recognize this guy. This is Gilligan from Gilligan's Island. Well, my name is Tim Wilson. And I go by Gilligan on Data because Tim Wilson is a pretty mundane name. I've been in the digital analytics space for about 10 years, working with everything from NetGenesis to Web Trends to Site Catalyst to Core Metrics, as well as BI and data warehousing and customer data management. I've been both client side and agency side. As a matter of fact, I spent the last three years managing the analytics discipline at a company called Resource which is now the largest independent agency in the country. Resource works primarily with large consumer brands. And those consumer brands, when I started, a lot of them were still trying to figure out whether they should take social media seriously. They were wondering, they were actually asking, is Facebook really here to stay or is it going to go the way of MySpace? Well, obviously, three years later, things have changed quite a bit. And all of these brands are taking social media seriously. So as the guy in, responsible for our analytics at the company, I had a lot of these brands and our, and our account managers coming to me asking those questions. How do we use data effectively in a social media world? I'm actually no longer a resource. I recently joined a company called Clearhead, which is a digital optimization agency. It's really focused on something I'm passionate about, which is helping companies really become data-driven, always being asking questions, always coming up with hypotheses, always testing those hypotheses, and having a, a process and a methodology to always be learning and improving. And I've been here for just a few weeks. So let's dive into the topic. Now, I go by Gilligan on data, so I'm the, I'm the analyst Gilligan, and I have to kind of start this off by doing a little bit of, of, of verbal ledger domain, and that really, if you look at Gilligan's Island, I would argue that Gilligan is actually much more like the community manager than he is like an analyst. He's got a lot of the characteristics of a community manager. He's, he's likable. He's always try, he, he is always trying to help out. He's the guy that everyone likes. And a community manager, that's kind of their role. They're in many ways one of the primary faces of the brand. And they're out there trying to foster the community and support the community and make the community that... that there that's interacting with their brand successful. Now, at the same time, in some ways, Gilligan, while he's great personality wise and he's great with his intentions, sometimes he can be a little bit clueless. And that's not a, a mean thing to say that I think community managers are clueless, but I think community managers do need help when it comes to effectively using data. So if Gilligan is like a community manager, then Many other aspects of the cast can or should be like an analyst. So the analyst is a multifaceted individual. They're supporting the star of the show. The community manager really is a fundamental core piece and one of the most visible pieces of a company's social media program. So there are different attributes, different ways that an analyst can actually support the community manager. And what I'm going to do is walk through how different members of the Gilligan's Island cast actually represent different aspects and different types of support that an analyst can provide to their community manager. Now, before we go ahead, don't, don't worry too much. I'm not actually going to say that there's any way that an analyst needs to be like Lovey Howell. Honestly, she really wasn't a whole lot of use to, to anyone on the show. And it pains me a little bit, although I'm much more of a Marianne fan, to say that really Ginger doesn't have a whole lot of aspects of a analyst either when it comes to supporting a community manager, but everyone else does. So let's go ahead and dive in. What we're looking to do is at the end of the day, we don't want our community manager and the analyst to look like this. We don't want them to be scared, looking at each other, wondering where they're heading, what's going on, deer in the headlights look. What we want is a much more, you know, adoring relationship on a paradise island, working collaboratively, collaboratively and, and both you know, happy and focused and, and well aware of how we're going to get by and get to the next day and get off the island. 
So the start of our three-hour tour, okay, don't worry, it's, it's a 30-minute it's a tour, really has to start with that basic question of what actually is social media analytics? What does that even mean? If you go to the community manager, one, they're not consciously asking that question. If you ask them, what is the analyst supposed to do? Well, there are lots of data-related things that a community manager probably doesn't inherently want to deal with. They may think the analyst is there to help explain Facebook insights and make sense of it. Or the analyst is there to tell me how I should be using cloud score or to come up with ROI or to figure out how big data plugs into social media. So in this case, when it comes to what the analyst's role is, well, we need to be a little bit like the professor. And like the professor in that we need to get a little bit academic, not so academic that we're now lecturing to the community manager and putting them to sleep by any means, but academic in that we need to have clarity and recognize that, that the role of an analyst when it comes to social media is actually broader than the role of an analyst when it comes to just traditional web analytics. And we need that clarity because as a community manager comes to us with questions, we need to realize that they have questions that are in completely different realms of data usage. And the way that we're handling those questions and supporting the community manager needs to vary accordingly. So call it three buckets. We've got analytics. And I would say this is the, the place that is the most closely directly mappable to traditional web analytics. It's your reporting, your performance measurement, your dashboards, your ROI calculations, it's also your analysis and your optimization, your hypothesis testing. So that's something that uh, absolutely analysts should be doing with a social media, with an eye specifically on social media. But then there's monitoring and moderation. This is what your community manager, that's primarily their focus, right? They're out there engaging proactively with the community. They're listening for comments about the brand and responding to them. They're posting on their Facebook page and they're moderating the responses. So this is where the community manager is coming from. And while it's very operational, there's an opportunity for an analyst to help them prioritize and filter what they look at, when they look at it, and you know, kind of guide what needs to be responded to and what doesn't. And then there's a third bucket, and this gets really broad, and that's the listening and learning. There are some community managers who are tasked with really having their, their finger on the pulse of the broad community of potential current and potential customers of the brand, whether they're current client, current customers or not. So in a lot of ways, this maps to, to consumer research. And maybe your company has a, a consumer research department. But when you look at consumer research, a lot of times those researchers are thinking of, you know, there's primary research and there's secondary research. And social media really isn't either one. It's got aspects of kind of both. So if you've got a consumer research department and that group has really embraced uh, and is tasked with, with li listening to the community and, and gleaning whatever relevant insights they, they can, then that's fine. But in a lot of cases, the community manager is expected to also have their ear to the ground to those broader conversations and to be pulling up the, the, the trends and the hot topics from that community, even if it's not specifically tied to the brand at all. And again, that's an opportunity for the analysts to help kind of broaden our own capabilities and to help filter and prioritize what it is uh, the community manager is trying to digest and assess. So one of the reasons that all three of these get a little bit jum jumbled is because really there are so many tools and the tools kind of overlap with these different areas. And what the community manager wants to do is they hope that they're heading out with kind of the, this finite set of tools. They're ready for their, to go out and, and community manage. They've got, a, they've got Hootsuite and they've got Facebook Insights and they, they want to have everything they need to be well prepared. But pretty quickly when they get into actually doing community management, they realize there are tons of tools. And it is, it is truly not an exaggeration to say that there are hundreds of social media analytics platforms. Ken Burberry has a wiki that at last check had 228 different platforms 
all which had aspects of them that were for doing social media analytics. And I've certainly had cases where I've gone to that wiki and I've had a, a new tool land in my inbox and it's not there. So it's an ever growing list. So instead of looking like this, the community manager really gets much more of a, oh my God, you know, I wanted to manage a community. I didn't want to have to wade through this sea of ever evolving, different functionality, very confusing, uh, you know, huge sea of, of tools and platforms. And they will often turn to the analyst and say, tell me what tools I should be using. Can you help me? You're kind of much more of a technical data person. Which tools should I be using? Tell me the best tool. And in this case, we need to be a little bit more like Marianne. Now, you know, kids today may have the Edward versus Jacob. Are you team Edward or team Jacob? Or are you team Gail or team Peta? Well, back in my day, in my generation, many, many boys were Team Ginger or Team Marianne. And I fell very much in the majority of studies that have been done. I was definitely a Team Marianne because Marianne was very, very capable. She was willing to dive in and get her hands dirty. Along with the professor, you know, they were, they were kind of the, the competent tandem on the island. So she could dive in and really figure things out. So for Marianne to do that, with that aspect of an analyst, we have to recognize, for starters, while there are hundreds of tools, they really can be grouped into different types of tools. They're the tools that are very channel specific because they're solely, they're limited to data from one specific social media platform. So be that Facebook provides Facebook insights, YouTube provides YouTube analytics. They both have uh, reporting for, for paid media on their channels. They all have APIs, and those APIs get used by other platforms that are exclusively channel specific, that are just taking that data out and making it more useful by arranging it and presenting it in different ways. So Facebook has the Insights API and the Graph API, YouTube has an API, Twitter has the Firehose as well as the Search API, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it. So that's one group of tools. Then you have the social relationship management tools. These are the platforms that, in most cases, this is what the community manager started with. They got Hootsuite. And you know what? Hootsuite has analytics built into it. What I found with these platforms and what the community managers often find is that, yes, they have charts and graphs, but really those are just efforts by those platforms to say, we've already got this data. Let's just kind of render it in kind of a, a reasonable way that matches kind of our operations. They're not really providing, trying to provide effective analytics platforms, but that's a place that is definitely a data source. And that's something where the community manager probably started and probably is finding limitations. Then you've got your listening platforms and there are a lot of those. Radian 6 still being the you know, the big kahuna in that space, but lots of other system of sync apps, SM2, NM Insight, uh, you name it. Those are out trying to actually listen to everything that's going on in social media and allowing a community manager or an analyst or somebody to filter down using keywords or some other mechanism, a subset of all of those conversations across all social media platforms. We have our site side analytics. Now, that's, that's web analytics, certainly, and if part of the, what the community manager is trying to do is drive traffic to, to the, the, the brand's website, then looking at referral data, looking at campaign tracking, absolutely, your site-side analytics provide that, and that's something the analyst can help with. Well, let's not forget about voice of the customer. You know, 4C came out probably almost two years ago with their social media value calculation, where they said, look, yes, people will click through on links from social media to a site, but people will also be exposed to or interact with brands on social media, and they will then go to the site on their own through search or through a direct, direct, directly typing the URL. So let's ask them, let's ask our respondents, have you been exposed, have you engaged with this brand through social media? And what they found, not surprisingly, is they saw much higher rates when they asked than they were seeing when just looking at referral data from web analytics. So that's important. If you have voice of the customer, it is a place for you to capture, gather, uh, 
additional information about who's engaging with social media and what are their other attitudes. And then finally, we have uh, influencer calculators, clout, peer index, cred, you name it. Now that's in quotes for, for a few reasons and we'll, we'll touch on that later. So if you take all these different types of tools and you layer those against the types of analytics, you start to see a lot of, you start to see overlap. And this is the professor and Marianne coming together, which many of us were kind of rooting for because they would have been such a great match. But this is a reason that an analyst, a community manager, isn't going to be thinking through with this level of clarity. But as analysts, we can and we should. We should make sure that based on the question that's being asked, we understand what type of question it is, and then we realize what class or which subset of tools are probably most appropriate for answering that question. So how do we do that when it comes to tool selection? Many times I've had a community manager come to me and say, what do you think of this tool or what tool should I be using? And the very first thing we have to do in our Marianne role is make sure that it's not about the tool. We have to start with what data do we want? And not only is it what data do we want, it's really kind of what data do you think you want? And let's put our critical thinking hat on and say, will that data really be actionable? One of my favorite examples here was I had a community manager who said, you know what data we need? We need to know for this big retailer that has a ton of stores, what we wanna know is every time somebody becomes a mayor, a new, newly anointed the mayor of one of those stores. And maybe we'll get that from Twitter, maybe we'll get it from Foursquare, but imagine the people who become mayors of a store, you know, those are definitely loyal customers because they're checking in at the store a lot. And before we headed down that path, you know, I stopped and said, now, wait a minute, Do, who's going to be the most common people checking in at a store? Is it going to be a customer or is it going to be an employee? And obviously it's going to be an employee. I would, I would claim, I don't even need to dig in and do a bunch of research. The 99.5% of the time, the mayor of any retail outlet is an employee. And it probably doesn't even have to be a full-time employee. A part-time employee is still spending more time at the store than even their most loyal customer. So we have to start there and say, are we really clear on the data that we want? And if we kind of mentally validated that we truly would be able to act on that data. From there, we have to ask the question, is that data available? And by available, not what tool can I go get this from? but available based on our understanding of how Twitter works, how Facebook works, how Foursquare works. I like to say that, that you know, no tool can violate the physics of the internet. It's just like when we have had, if we have somebody come to us for our website and say, who says, I wanna know for every visitor to the website, I wanna know whether they're male or female and I wanna know their age. Well, we know that the internet doesn't work that way. When people come to the site, they're anonymous to a certain extent. We may be able to approximate gender, we may be able to ask some people and scale it, but we know that when somebody's just visiting our site from a browser, pre-registration, pre-login, we don't know what their gender is. Well, the same thing goes for social media. Yes, Twitter has an email address for every single person on Twitter, but no tool actually has access to the email address for an individual user. So that's a, a critical question to ask because if, if we just understand what data tools have and what data they're making available and the terms of use of that data, sometimes we can say, I know it would be great to have that data. It would be great to know the email address of every one of your Twitter followers, but that data is not available. So we don't need to go looking for tools that will make it available. And if a tool is telling you that it's available, we need to immediately probe and find out and get some more detail from them as to how they're pulling that off because magic is not actually uh, something that any tool can do. They can be clever, but they still feel to articulate basically how they're achieving what they're, what they're achieving and what data they're providing. Then asking the question, you know, we already have probably more tools than we want. We have three or four or five tools that we're using. For what the data we want, do we already have a tool that, that has that data? Now that, that data may not be readily available on the tool's current interface, but if we understand what data the tool has and, what, and how, it's, how it's getting that data and storing it, sometimes it's very easy to have a minor extension to the tool. 
to reach out to the vendor and say, look, I know what data you're capturing. You know what I'd love to see? Well, you know, would it be possible to do a, a, a filter of tweets based on the keyword in a Twitter's profile as opposed to based on keywords within a tweet? And in many cases, if we can articulate what data we want and why we think how we'll act on it and that we know that it's available, a lot of these vendors in this fiercely competitive space, they're thrilled to be given features to add to their, their roadmap that will differentiate them, that they can hold out as something that they're available to their other customers. And I've actually had this happen with, with multiple Twitter platforms where I've asked for things and inside of a month, that capability has been ready, has been available. But sometimes it's just the data is there. We just haven't really thought, we haven't gone and looked in the full set of tools we already have to, to try to actually pull that data out. Then rather than starting a big RFP process, because by the, in the, by the time you complete a full RFP process, most of the uh, tools will have updated and the, the data you'd have would be, would be outdated, look to the experts. At, at eMetrics, you know, Beth Cantor and actually Katie Payne were both keynoting, John Lovett presenting, you know, well-regarded social media experts, social media analytics experts, reaching out to them on social media with a clearly articulated, this is what I'm looking for, what are you hearing people are using? They can be very, very responsive, very timely. Uh, the same thing, reaching out to the measure community on Twitter and asking those questions. And then finally, the analyst, can actually do a quick proof of concept. Almost every tool has some way to do a seven day or a 14 day trial. Some of them, you know, Radian 6 requires that you go through a one hour online training before they give you the trial, but they'll give you the trial. And there's an opportunity for the analyst to actually try out a tool and say, does this tool really work? Now what's key with this whole process is that the analysts can do almost all of this on their own. The community manager shouldn't need to shepherd things through. The community manager shouldn't even need to know the diligence of this process that you're going through. The community manager, the analyst, you can work with them and say, we're really clear on what data we want and, and whether it will be actionable. The analyst, the community manager can go back to community managing and the analyst can go through a very disciplined approach to actually finding out how to get that data, the best data possible into the community manager's hands. And the community manager will love the analyst, loves the analyst when they do that. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the ROI of social media. Community managers don't want to calculate the ROI of social media, but they know they have been or they know they will be asked to demonstrate and prove the value of what they're doing with the company's investment in social media and their and the investment in their time. And in this case, of course, talking about Thurston Howell III. Presumably, he did not become the millionaire simply by being born wealthy. Presumably, he was a savvy businessman. And he actually made his millions by achieving high ROI on his investments. Well, the way he did that is really using the two magic questions. He had cases where he was investing in branding and investing in things where he didn't have a hard financial calculation of specific hard, hard financial return. What he probably did was he asked those two questions that we should always as analysts be asking, certainly beyond, beyond social media, but with social media as well. First question, what is it we want to achieve with social media? And call it, call it your goals, call it your objectives. doesn't matter what you call it. How do you clearly, clearly articulate what you're trying to accomplish? And then second, how will you know if you've actually done that? And those are your success measures or your KPIs. Okay, so it's simple, two simple questions that aren't necessarily simple to answer. So how do we do that? Well, here we turn to the skipper. And well, it's not really this skipper, it's a different skipper. And if we remove, remove this, this elaborate disguise, we realize it's none other than John Lovett. He's not just the president of the DAA. He's not just a senior, department, a senior partner at, at Web Analytics Demystified. He's also, of course, the author of Social Media Metric Secrets. This is the one hard, firm endorsement I will provide in this presentation, and that is John's book. And when it comes to the ROI of social media, 
chapters four and five of his book are fantastic because he actually answers those two magic questions. He gives you all the tools you need to be 75% down the road of answering those questions. For the first question, what is it we're trying to accomplish? John lays out six possibilities for social media. And whether you use the exact words or not, it's a great jumping off point. Are you trying to spur innovation? Are you actually investing in social media so that you can get product ideas that you can feed back to R&D? You know, there are very few companies that are doing it, doing that. It's valid, but if that's what you're doing, that's very, very different from just trying to increase the reach of your brand or, or gaining exposure. So not only does John answer the first question and say, look, these are six highly, highly likely things that you might be trying to accomplish. And by the way, hopefully you're not trying to accomplish all six. Hopefully it's one or two or maybe three. The second thing John does is go in, the, in those two chapters is lays out good solid KPIs for each one of these objectives. And he defines them kind of channel agnostically. He says, look, you have to go with the tools that you have and the platforms you're on to come up with your specific definitions, but I can give you kind of pseudo definitions and you can run from there. So I highly, highly recommend that, that book. And you know, he had a session yesterday. Uh, he has talked extensively on this as well. This is just purely, if you're interested in this and this is something you need to do, get the book. He articulates it really, really well. And it was really, really valuable when I worked with multiple brands trying to come up with what the right things to measure were. Of course, then you'll also get people, the community manager may say, yeah, that's great. You've helped me articulate what I'm trying to do, but I have to really show business value. And you stop short of, of how I'm going to show that business value. So here's something that I started doing and, and it worked really pretty well with a number of uh, packaged goods brands. And what I used was a, a technique called causal modeling. So I looked at this from a, a HBR paper called, I think, Measuring Performance with Non-Financial Measures that's, that's now, it's eight or nine years old. So it wasn't really talking about social media, but the, the idea applied pretty well. So if you take your the objectives you've identified, you've worked with the community manager and said, help me answer that first question. I've got potential answers, but what are we really trying to do? And write those down. And then look at what business outcome is our company really most focused on driving towards? Jim Stern's book, many business books say, you know, there are really three business outcomes that you're possibly focusing on. Increasing revenue, decreasing costs or increasing profitability, or improving customer service, increasing customer satisfaction, driving customer loyalty, right? Those are kind of the, the, the holy triad of business. And businesses can't be successful if they try to compete and be excellent at all three. They have to focus on one, maybe two, and then be at least competent in the third. So you should, with your business, know what is our priority right now? What are we really trying to do? You put that down. And then you start, you take off your, your hard quantitative data hat, you put on your marketing hat, your strategy hat, your creative thinking hat, and say, how do we logically link what we think our objectives are to our business outcomes? For instance, if we've said we're using social media to increase the reach of the brand, well, what's that doing for us? Well, that means that, that if we increase the reach, that means the brand is now in the consideration set for a broader set of people when they're trying to make a purchase decision. If we, it's in the consideration set of more people, then logically more people are going to buy. And you can repeat that and realize that things are kind of interconnected. Promoting advocacy actually winds up uh, increasing the reach of the brand. So laying this out in a very, very concise, succinct way, this is based on a, a very real one. It needs to fit on one page. It needs to be as simple as possible. Part of what you'll do is you'll validate the objectives. If you find that you have to jump through three or four steps before you can link one of your, what you think one of your social media objectives is all the way to a business outcome, you probably should be questioning, is that a valid objective? What you're trying to do here is help the community manager articulate the value of what they're doing. And then secondly, you can talk to whether it's the CMO, the CFO, the CEO, say, logically, I can't actually quantify the value of a tweet. I can't tell you that a retweet is going to result in an incremental increase in revenue 
of, of $25. But I understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to move as far right in this diagram as I can to reasonably measure because the KPIs that I've picked are actually tied to the objectives and they're tied to what I can control. So it's not a magic, it's not a perfect formula. It's still, I get it, vaguely unsatisfying because you want that hard math to say, this is the hard ROI, but this has actually been effective. It's helped the community manager get clarity in their own mind, but then also articulate and be consistent when they're talking to their peers and their managers and on up the chain as to why they're doing what they're doing. It's also where you jump off and you can do the regular reporting for them of their performance because you've helped them nail down the, the right KPIs. And a community manager should almost never be doing their own reporting. They're just, it doesn't tend to be what they're wired for. As analysts, we should be a, probably should be the most efficient people in the company when it comes to pulling data. We should be some of the best people in the company at effectively presenting and visualizing that data in the right context. So absolutely, the analyst can and should be providing that performance measurement function and then collaborating with the community manager to say, are we good with the way these measures are moving? Are all of our KPIs looking good? So that's the performance measurement aspect, but there's also the analysis and optimization. And here, the analyst is back to being the professor. And in this case, it's more like the professor teaching an eighth grade science class good old hypothesis testing. So we know as analysts that the way that you do good analysis is you have a hypothesis and then you test it and you disprove it or you fail to disprove it. Well, you don't want to go to your community manager and say, what hypotheses do you have? Because they will uh, walk away and avoid you uh, from that point forward unless you ask them these other silly questions. But community managers do have questions. Every day they are making decisions on how they're actually doing their community management. And they're wondering, are they doing it right? Are they doing it optimally? So if you can get from your community manager what their top questions are, and actually I'll talk in a, in a minute about capturing and, catalog and pri cataloging and prioritizing them. Once you have a question from the community manager, the community manager, quest the question may be, you know, we've been, I'm posting three times a week on our Facebook page. I have no idea if that's the right, right amount of time. Should I be posting on Facebook more? From that point, a good analyst can actually do a number of things with minimal community manager, manager involvement. First thing is to translate that question into a testable hypothesis. With that example of how often should I be posting, say as an analyst, maybe I'd say that I have a hypothesis that we could post twice as often as we're posting now and we would increase the reach of the page, which is one of our KPIs, without any serious negative repercussions. So the analyst can do that, can make it into a testable hypothesis, can then also determine how best to test. With social media, most of the time, A-B testing is not an option. You can't really do split testing with your tweets. But you can look at historical data and say, gee, have there been cases where we posted six times a week instead of three times a week? And if not, maybe you have to go back to the community manager and say, to answer your question, I need you to temporarily change your behavior. I need you to actually for another, for a week or for the next two weeks, I need you to post twice as often. And I'm doing that in the service of answering your question, not because it's right or wrong, I don't know yet, but I will if you do it and I get some data collected that I can use to test the hypothesis. So then you actually conduct the test. You can be a bit of a project manager. When are we gonna start posting more frequently and for how long? You'll have to let it run for two weeks and then I, the analyst, will go back and analyze that data and ultimately deliver the results and say, this was your question and here's the answer that I have. So that's actually a pretty common question uh, we, we got this from, from multiple community managers. How often should we post? They'd also ask, what days of the week should I be posting on? Is Monday better than Thursday? Uh, what time of day should I be posting? And I'm not totally in love with this visualization, uh, but in this case, it actually worked. What we found very quickly with this series of questions, and we probably didn't have as much discipline as we should have about specific questions we were trying to answer, 
But by doing an analysis where we made a little grid of, of time of day and day of week, and we looked at how often the brand had been posting over the course of the last, uh, I think it was month or two. And then we looked at the, the reach of their posts and the engagement they were getting from their posts. And for one thing, we realized that they had never posted before 9 a.m. Eastern. They had never posted on a Sunday. They had only posted once after 6 p.m. So we were able to present to them, you know, for starters, you're really doing your posting during work hours when you, the community manager, are working. And we probably could update the frequency because there are whole pockets where we're not even trying to, to post. And then we did kind of a little bit of a heat map around the reach and post engagement to try to nail down what the best and worst times for that brand to post were. And we did this. We actually had them update, increase their post frequency we did have them ultimately dramatically realize they could post a lot more often. They should be posting on the weekends. They should be posting in a broader uh, set of times, which worked well because they were actually increasing their post frequency. So they needed to have more times to post anyway. So community managers have lots and lots of questions. And something the analyst can do is maintain a catalog of those questions. Help the community manager anytime they have a question even if you can't answer it right now, even if your plate is already full and, and you've already got other questions you're trying to answer for them, keep that running log, keep that catalog, work with them to prioritize it so that you're always in a pattern of asking questions and then trying to answer those questions. And the answers to many of those questions are going to beget more, beget more questions. So it can be literally a, a never ending process, but because you've got good KPIs to find, you've got questions that are coming in and the community manager is not spending an undue amount of time trying to answer the questions, you're this very effective partner who knows how to very rigorously go and definitively answer the questions, you're, you're basically driving the, the data-driven continuous improvement that we all want to drive. So finally, you know, there's the old friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, there are a couple of things that I have to say analysts don't let community managers do hopefully without physically you know, tying them up, but by having a great relationship, there are two things. One, analysts don't let community managers obsess about automated sentiment analysis. It was actually in an eMetrics a couple of years ago, and I, I distinctly remember it was Michael Healy and Gary Angel were presenting on sentiment analysis, uh, and we're both pretty highly skeptical. And Michael actually used this example. Uh, this vacuum cleaner really sucks. This is clearly a tweet that has strong sentiment. There's strong emotion in it. But we don't know whether it's positive. Uh, hey, this vacuum cleaner really sucks. Sucks up stuff. We don't know if it's negative. This vacuum cleaner really sucks. And we don't even know what brand it's for. So the lack of context, the, the short, very short nature of much of social media, Twitter's 140 characters, but Facebook are pretty small little blips as well of, of content. Same thing with, with, with Pinterest and Instagram. We're talking kind of one sentence, context limited uh, material. So what we've seen, and there are a, a ton of misinformed blog posts and articles that talk about trending sentiment over time about a brand. Well, that's great, except I would argue that sentiment doesn't gently trend in a very detectable social media way. There are lots of things affecting consumers' sentiment about a brand, their in-store experience, their call center experience, the experience with the products they bought from the brand, and yes, their social media experience. If you dump millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, yes, you will detect on social media a legitimate change in sentiment about your brand but you don't really need social media to tell you that. So you can have all these conversations with a community manager who says, I want to trend sentiment over time and still not really hit the mark. So the, the best way I've found to really help them understand how, how noisy automated sentiment analysis is, is to actually pull data. And so what I'll do is go in and say, depending on the brand and how much conversation is happening, I may pull the last week or the last month's worth of, of posts or tweets about a brand 
and I'll pull the ones that the platform flagged as positive, and I'll pull the ones that it flagged as negative, and I'll just skim through them, and I'll pull out the examples that are, you know, really egregious, you know, misfires for me as a human being reading it. In the case of a, of a retailer, this is one of the examples where I did it, major, major box retailer, and the, a lot of the stuff getting flagged as positive were uh, employees who were really happy to be ending their employment with that uh, retailer. The same thing on the negative, there were cases where flagged as negative, somebody who said, I hate the shirt I'm wearing, but I'm gonna go to the retailer really quickly and fix that problem. That's clearly positive. So by actually giving them the full set and say, you read through these and let's not knock the tool as being having its shortcomings that it can't magically quantify these things. Just understand it will become more real to you as a community manager and you will realize how you are effectively trying to measure static and make that a KPI. And it's really never going to be actionable. And I'll also point out what they'll see is that Somebody will say something funny or sarcastic, highly shareable, that has some sort of language that makes it get flagged as positive or negative, and it'll get traction. It'll get retweet, retweeted, shared, repeated, and it'll bubble up, and all of a sudden it looks like you've had a spike when really you've had one post that has gotten shared a bit, which is very different from people just organically having, you know, expressing sentiment about a brand. So... I just try to really, really push them to not we'll try to treat sentiment as something that they're really going to meaningfully trend over time. Does that mean that automated sentiment analysis has no place whatsoever? No. If you remember, I said that there was monitoring and moderation and listening and learning being part of the thing, part of the, the, the capabilities that analysts could help with, help a community manager with. So, that's a place where I think automated sentiment analysis can be really useful. So if there are 10,000 posts or tweets about a brand, a community manager says, I, don't, I can't possibly read all 10,000 posts or comments. Well, this is where you can use your tool and say, let's pull all the ones that are flagged as positive or negative. It's going to probably be less than 10% of all of the, the posts. I'm going to narrow it down to 1,000 or maybe 500. Because those are likely to be the tweets that have some sort of charge, some sort of emotion in them. They are more likely to be of interest. Because frankly, there are a lot of times a brand is mentioned that are completely anodyne, zero insight whatsoever. It's just the brand is mentioned in passing, and it's not that useful. So as long as the community manager understands they're getting you know, a, a biased uh, sample, but they are getting a, a set of, of posts and comments that are likely or more likely to be interesting, to be something that uh, they do actually either want to respond to or something that they just, you know, realize that, oh, that the brand is being used in this specific context. So I'm not saying by any means that never look at automated sentiment analysis at all. Just don't look at it as a, as a hard counting, reliable measure. And then finally, analysts don't let community managers obsess about finding influencers. To me, this is marketers looking kind of the never-ending search for shortcuts that don't exist. We had the old, we're going to shoot a viral video. Well, it doesn't really work like that. We had the, we're going to pay a company to dramatically boost our, dramatically and quickly boost our, our, our organic search rankings. Well, not without doing some black hat stuff that might get you in trouble. You know, one more, you know, we're going to roll out a new technology and that's going to just enable one-to-one -one marketing. The sales guy said it would. Well, there's a whole lot of hard work and a whole lot of data you need and a whole lot of planning to actually pull that off. And I claim that we're going to identify influencers to drive purchases of our brand is kind of just the next iteration in that that, that look for that hope for a shortcut. And what we have this kind of weird idea that we're not looking for the celebrities. We're not looking for, we don't need to know that if a celebrity tweets about our brand, that that may actually drive people to change their, their performance or change, change their purchase behavior. What we're hoping for is to find some weird kind of semi-anonymous tier of people who are 
magically being looked to for advice in a specific, specific category and who are saying things about our brand or about the category that are driving people to purchase in sufficient volume that it actually moves the needle. Well, that's all kind of wildly naive. And I, what I'll use with community managers there is I'll say, let's stop and, and stop thinking about as marketers and marketers' hopes and dreams. And let's think of as consumers just for a few minutes. When was the last time you, you know, think about the last purchase you made where you can name somebody who influenced you on that purchase? You know, you bought a new stylus for your iPad and you asked the, the designer that you work with who does great stuff on his iPad for advice on what stylus he liked. Or you bought a piece of luggage, a new piece of rollerboard luggage, and you bought it because you were getting off the plane behind a coworker who traveled more than you did. And that coworker said, you know, you said my rollerboard's getting beat to shit. Uh, what, you know, what, what, why do you have that brand? And he said, gee, I, I, I did a little research and I bought this. It was, it's, it was kind of pricey overall, but I got it on sale and I've loved it. And three months later, you went and bought that same piece of luggage. Whatever that example is, if you ask the next question, would that person ever have bubbled up in any tool as being an influencer in that category? The answer is almost always no, because people get influenced offline and online. And when they get influenced for one thing, uh, it's not necessarily because they're looking to somebody who is identifiable as, as an expert. If you actually move to the people who are identifiable as experts because they blog and tweet about a subject a lot, you start to get into really dangerous territory. What are you going to do with those people? Are you going to go and try to manipulate them to start pushing your brand more heavily? Are you going to send them free stuff? You know, that's we're three or four years past all of that blowing up as to how bloggers had to get very, very clear about when they were getting free trials of products when they were doing sponsored stuff where a brand was paying them versus when they were truly being their own voice. So it's just, it's, you're looking for something that I would claim may exist, but in not a remotely findable way and not in the mass where it would actually warrant uh, a heavy investment to go and try to activate these influencers. But on that front, if you just change that from influencers to advocates, I am 110% champion of that. And social media absolutely can help you find your strong brand advocates. And then I would claim, do you really need, do you care whether those advocates are hugely influential? Or do you really just think if you cheaply and efficiently reward and thank and foster those people who are advocating for your brand already, you will have some of them who have, you know, that what they say highly, highly amplified. And you have some that they won't. But you don't have to obsess too, too much about that. So I push to say, let's drive for identifying advocates. And if anything, we want to advocate, activate the advocates. Well, let's not start looking for this kind of a mythical influencer. And on that front, I actually do think cloud is useful. Although cloud is kind of an influencer score. And even cloud says, you know, we do the best we can. If you treat cloud as something that it really is, which is a, is a, is a good measure of, of high versus low social engagement, social presence, social involvement, it's very useful on that front. Am I gonna say a cloud score of 54 is somebody with a stronger presence than somebody that has a 53? No, but if somebody has a cloud score of 54 and somebody else has a cloud score of 12, that really is a big difference. So using clout to help you filter and identify the people who are advocating for your brand and the ones who seem to already have a strong social presence. And maybe those are the ones that you do want to focus more on, on rewarding and continuing to activate and thanking them. That absolutely does make sense. At the end of the day, what we want is the community manager and the analysts to have a strong relationship, to trust each other, to respect each other, to complement each other, complement with the C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T, although they're, they can complement each other both ways. With that, it can be really successful. You can actually 
live a pretty nice living on the island, you know, without any real need to get off, uh, to, to build the community, to foster the brand, and work very effectively together. And that is all I have. Thank you for your time. And I can be reached on Twitter at TG Wilson, or you can find me pretty easily on my blog at GilliganOnData.com. Thanks.